today we're hosting Luis Fernando Garcia. Luis Fernando Garcia is the director for the Red de Derechos Digitales, which broadly translates to English as the Digital Rights Network. And uh, they're tasked with uh, defending di digital rights uh, in Mexico. And to that end, they've conducted a series of initiatives, among which it's, uh, they have an initiative that tries to track surveillance. And today, uh, Luis will talk to us about uh, some research effort that, they've, uh, that they started uh, some months ago that led to, to some interesting revelations about, um, uh, about how the Mexican government surveils individuals in Mexico. And with that, I'll turn it over to, to Luis. Uh, well, hi. Uh, thank you for having me. Thank you for Google for, to invite me. I'm Luis Fernando Garcia, and I'm the director of R3D, the Digital Rights Defense Network for Mexico. We are an NGO, nonprofit, that we do uh, research, litigation, advocacy, communication strategies to try to promote a human rights perspective on the interactions between humans and technology. Um, we work on a different range of issues from privacy and surveillance, which is what I will be talking about right now, to other issues of freedom of expression online, on uh, access to the internet, on access to knowledge, uh, et cetera. So just um, a little bit of background about Mexico. Uh, not everyone's always aware about what hap what's happening in other countries. But in Mexico, um, there is a government right now that has been five years on and that has been uh, riddled with uh, uh, scandals from the start. It's been a, a government that has been, uh, uh, I mean, has the government right now has around 10% approval rating, uh, which is pretty low. Uh, and the reason why they got there is be because there's been scandals on corruption, on human rights abuses, and there's been a lot of uh, turmoil in Mexico about uh, the situation uh, uh, in Mexico. In this, this, this context is important uh, to understand the rest of the story that I will, that I will tell, but I probably will explain some other uh, 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 events that have been happening in Mexico to give some context. So the presentation I prepared for you today is uh, it's called Gobierno Espia, which translates to like spying government. Um, and it's about how we've been uncovering and resisting illegal surveillance in Mexico. Our organization is actually pretty uh, young. Uh, we didn't exist three years ago. Um, and in that, that time, 2014, we started precisely because there was uh, a problem. Um, there were uh, a there was a telecommunications law being discussed in Congress, and we were very worried that uh, issues of, of surveillance, of privacy, and freedom of expression online were not going to be part of the discussion in the in, in Congress. So we uh, got together, and we didn't have in a website or a logo or anything. We just uh, tried to do what we could to promote uh, a perspective of human rights. And and one of the issues that we were worried is was uh, was privacy. Uh, the, tele the telecommunications law that was proposed w expanded surveillance in, in various ways uh, in, uh, that we uh, felt it was dangerous. No? But first, um, there's one thing that it's important to, maybe it's, it's, it's obvious for some people, but it, I don't want to uh, stop uh, myself from saying it. Um, the difficulty to research, to do advocacy, to, um, uh, to handle surveillance as a society is, is, it has its own particularities. Uh, for, for one, it's um, uh, a tool that is highly invasive, that is highly powerful. The, the person that can have access to other people's uh, information has lots of power over that person. But at the same time, uh, surveillance that is carried out by the state normally and naturally is carried out in secret. So there's a problem here because normally when there are uh, abuses of, uh, by the government, there are ways in which at least you can be aware of it and you can maybe try to challenge it. If the police enters to your house without a warrant or if you get detained, at least you know you're being detained, you know your house was entered and you can do something about it. Uh, in the case of surveillance, you don't know that the government is spying on you, and it's difficult for you to know, it's difficult for you to research it, to, to uh, resist it. And this uh, presents a set of issues that uh, need, needs that the, the law and technology and, and society in general treat this problem differently than other civil rights uh, problems. 
In 2014, when we started working on surveillance, there was this trend. You know, there was this trend. There were very strong security narratives. I will explain a couple of them. Um, but basically, and probably, I mean, people that from the US have experienced this since 2001. Uh, there's all this um, narrative of uh, asking you to, uh, to, to uh, lose civil liberties in, ch in exchange for security and all this like emotional blackmail that happens. Uh, and, and that, of course, there's, there's uh, a bit of true to that, but, but there's uh, this push by these narratives to try to uh, increase the power of the state and decrease the civil liberties that citizens have to resist it. Um, so uh, with this narrative, th there's also been, since 2009 probably, an another piece of context, since 2007, violence in Mexico increased dramatically. Uh, uh, the government and the army started uh, uh, fighting uh, drug cartels. And uh, since then, there's been like, a lot of violence. And this has fueled these narratives. And under this, in this context, uh, the government has been seeking more powers, more authorities uh, to do surveillance. And they have requested and pushed for less controls, less uh, uh, accountability, uh, because they want to act. I mean, they, what they say is they want to act faster, and they want to protect the people. Basically, there's two very strong narratives that have um, been used uh, to promote more surveillance and less controls. One, I, want, I like to call it um, this one. Won't somebody please think of the children? There, uh, there's an emotional appeal, like uh, we need to give government these tools because won't somebody think of the children? They are in danger. Uh, and the other one, uh, it's when you explain the, the, the problems that can happen if a, the government or any entity has too much power into the lives of people without accountability, and particularly with this problem that uh, invasions of privacy are often hidden from the public eye, uh, you are uh, labeled as someone like him, like Tim Fall Hat and like paranoid. Uh, and this was what we were against in 2014. We had this very strong narratives behind and pushing uh, uh, massive surveillance and less controls. And in the end, like the basic things that we had uh, approved by Congress in 2014 were mass surveillance with deter attention mandates. Uh, uh, we had a vagueness about who can carry out surveillance. For example, the law said, uh, and it, it, it established a lot of surveillance uh, tools or techniques and said that any competent authority could use this. Uh, and we, all, we said when the, when the discussion was in Congress, like, you need to define who is a competent authority. You cannot just leave it open like that. And they said, no, no, we're, we're going to leave it like that because other law says who is a competent authority. Well, this is what we said, and we'll see if we were right or wrong. Uh, we, if you leave it like this, a lot of authorities will say, I'm a competent authority. I'm interpreting it like I'm a competent authority. And then a lot of, of authorities, local, federal, even municipal, will feel like entitled or authorized by law to do, carry out surveillance. The same with judicial oversight. Uh, uh, in the Constitution of Mexico, to do a, a traditional lawful intercept of communications, you need a federal uh, judge to approve it. Uh, with regard to other types of surveillance, like lo location tracking in real time or uh, to access communications metadata from, from people, uh, the law was deliberately left in a very vague space, in a very gray area. We said, you need to establish very clearly that you need a warrant for this. And they said, I'm going to leave it like that because I want this room to maybe don't get a warrant. Um, there's also, there was also lack of transparency, lack of uh, independent supervision. So in some countries, there are authorities are in charge of supervising these authorities and, and trying to force them to uh, have some type, type of accountability with audits to certain cases, et cetera. Or the right to notification. In some countries as well, there's a right for you to know that you were, was, uh, were surveilled at, at one point. Maybe you are not uh, told 
uh, during the, the surveillance because maybe in some cases that could frustrate the, the legitimate objective of the surveillance, but you are told at one point, hey, six months ago, we, you were under investigation and we did surveillance on you, and if you think it was an abuse, you can do something about it. Well, none, none of those safeguards that have been identified and, and applied in many countries were present in Mexican law. So with these very bad laws, with these very strong narratives in place, um, who, please, some, who, somebody please think of the children, and if you do something about it, you're a paranoid, tinfoil hat person, we ask, how, how can we change the narrative? How can we produce change um, and, and make lawmakers, but society in general, understand that this is a very dangerous place uh, in which we were and which we are? So uh, what we did is a range of, of, of activities. We did litigation, and this law that was passed, we challenged it in court. Uh, we also did advocacy in Congress, trying to establish at least some safeguards and we had limited uh, success. Uh, a few years later, uh, uh, like a year and a half ago, uh, there were some transparency laws approved that established now obligations for authorities and even for telecommunication companies to provide detailed transparency reports, uh, statistical data mainly, but also, uh, for example, companies need to, telecommunication companies need to say who has asked them information and how many times and how many times they have said yes and how many times they have said no. And this is not, this does not solve the problem, but you will see it, it helps. It, it, it gives you indication that maybe things can go wrong or things are going right. The same with judicial oversight, but I will leave that story for a little bit later. Um, we also started to use like FOIA here in the US, Freedom of uh, Access to Information laws in Mexico, which are pretty decent, to try to get more information. And we tried to know what was going on, who was using surveillance, uh, uh, how many times, uh, et cetera. We tried to create evidence that the problems that we identified in the law when the, it was passed were actually materializing into real problems. And we also start, uh, try to document and to research uh, technologies being used and, and cases of, of abuse, which was di is difficult in, in general. For example, with the access to information um, uh, request, we ask thousands of, of requests to, all, to authorities all over Mexico to try to understand stuff like um, who is doing surveillance, uh, are they doing it with judicial oversight, uh, is it effective? Uh, is, are there any consistencies in the data that we're getting? Um, many of these requests turn, turned into hundreds of lawsuits. Uh, and for example, one of this, these cases even got into Supreme Court. Fortunately, we won. We, were trying, we wanted the, the NSA of Mexico, it's called CISEN, to tell us how many people they have surveilled. I don't want their names or anything, I just you know, want to know how many. You, did you surveil in 2014? And they didn't want to give us that information. It, it, it went into the Supreme Court, and unfortunately we won. And now, well, December last year we won, and they haven't told us yet, but supposedly we won and they will tell us, but we'll see. So after all this uh, request and all the data that we w were able to gather, we found a lot of problems. And here's a few uh, findings. Sorry, some of the charts are in Spanish, but yeah, uh, you will, I will explain them, no, no problem. For example, uh, this chart. Uh, this chart shows three federal authorities, the National Security Agency, the federal police, and the federal prosecutor. We asked them how many times they have, uh, they have asked a judge to authorize them to carry out surveillance. But we also asked the courts, and we told them, how many times have this guy come to you and asked for authorization? And we got totally different results depending who you ask. For example, the National Security Agency of Mexico told us that between 2013 and 2015, they requested a court to authorize surveillance a little bit over 2,000 times. But courts say, no, that guy only came 654 times. And for example, the federal prosecutor or like the Department of Justice similar to Mexico, in Mexico, it was completely the opposite. They said that they did only 866, but the court said no, he came 2,292 times. 
And this is just requests. Uh, we did uh, other, other uh, um, exercise in which we, we were able to identify that in, in, in average, by each request, uh, these authorities get authorization to uh, surveil on between seven and 10 people. So these are just, it's important. I mean, 2,000 is 2,000 people? No, 2,000 requests, which probably you can uh, yeah, m multiplicate that for seven, eight, nine, ten 10 times, depending on the year. So this, this doesn't prove necessarily that they are using it against people they shouldn't, but this just tells you something's wrong. Uh, something's not functioning well here. And uh, this is another thing. For example, we ask how many times what we were worried about. Like, the law doesn't say clearly that you need a warrant, but you told us that it did, but we told you it's not clear. It's not clear for companies, it's not clear for authorities. And when we asked how many times that you have access to communications metadata from telecommunications users, from uh, uh, cell phone users, um, close to 99% of, of the time, they did it without a warrant. Well, we said it was going to happen, and they said it was, wasn't going to happen, happened. 99% of the time, an authority went to your uh, uh, cell phone provider, asked for your data, and the cell phone provider just gave it away without a warrant. Another finding. Um, for example, this is, uh, we ask, well, we analyze reports from uh, the first transparency reports from the telecommunication companies. And we saw that, for example, in Mexico, there are basically three main cell phone carriers. Uh, one very big one, um, basically it was a monopoly. It still has most of, of the market, which is uh, called Telcel. Uh, it was the property of one of the richest men in the world, Carlos Slim. Um, and there's AT&T and there's Telefonica, a Spanish company. AT&T, for example, uh, re reject around 46% of the uh, requests they get from authorities. This means that they get a, re uh, a request and they analyze it and sometimes they say yes and sometimes they say no, as it should. Uh, Telefonica uh, is less, but still they reject some. But the biggest uh, cell phone company in Mexico, which is Telcel, never rejected one request. So anyone who said, I'm a competent authority without a warrant, give me your data, got it. Be, among those, a bunch of these uh, authorities, uh, some that have, have not been identified, but uh, this, these are names of, of authorities that do not have any legal basis to do any type of surveillance. Electoral commissions, uh, local police, uh, the communications ministry, uh, the governor of, of one state, uh, etc. cetera. Um, these, again, all these st statistics point to something that's very wrong, that authorities that don't have a clear legal mandate to do surveillance are doing it without a warrant, in secret, with no accountability, is a recipe for disaster. And we also, as I mentioned before, we wanted to test this, this claim that surveillance is so important and so necessary to prosecute crime. We asked prosecutors all around the country, how many investigations have you used surveillance? And, and where the, what happens with those investigations? Do they get someone in jail or not? Well, over 90% of the investigations in which an, a prosecutor used surveillance, that investigation either remains open or, or didn't turn out into charging anyone with any crime. So it's safe to say that more than 90% of the people that were, were surveilled in the context of a criminal investigation were never charged of any crime, which again, amounts data and evidence that there's something very wrong and that the claim that surveillance is super useful in Mexico, at least for criminal investigations, is at least an overstatement. So we use this research in litigation and we, it was very useful. Uh, we were able to get the Supreme Court to say, okay, okay, I'm gonna say who is a competent authority and that's it. And they reduce it to uh, very, like basically two groups of, of authorities, either the federal police and national security agency at the federal level and the prosecutors for investigating crimes. And always with a warrant, that's also something that the court said, thanks to the case that we, that, that we uh, brought to the, to the court, 
Uh, so it's clear now that you need a warrant to get content, to get metadata, and also to get uh, the location tracking of a person in real time. This was something that the court didn't say you needed, but we managed to convince Congress to pass a law to require it as well. So now it's clear, at least in the law, maybe not in practice, but it's clear that you need a warrant. And if you don't get a warrant to do any type of surveillance in Mexico, and if you are not one of these authorities, then the surveillance you're doing is illegal. But still, uh, these narratives remain uh, because you haven't proved that this has not been used against, this has been used against someone that shouldn't have been used. You just have data and then suggestions and suspicions, which are, I think, grounded in some evidence, but we haven't found, we haven't, some people just don't care unless you show them where the victim is. So that's what we try to work with, uh, we'll work on finding victims. How can we document, how can we create stories, and how, how, how can we show uh, uh, in flesh how surveillance looks like and how the surveillance that we presumed was being abused because all these data pointed to that. How can we prove and find someone that shouldn't have been surveilled that was surveilled? Some of our first um, indications that this might be happening and that, that actually um, surveillance was starting to become more sophisticated in Mexico was uh, documenting the acquisition and use of more sophisticated surveillance tools like malware. Here in the US, the NSA, the FBI, they probably like uh, build their own malware and their own surveillance tools. But in other countries like Mexico, they buy it from other co companies. For example, there's a company in Italy called Hacking Team. And the Hacking Team got hacked and all their data was published. Their emails, the contracts, and their Twitter account actually for more than 12 hours. Um, and in that data, it showed that Mexico was the biggest client of Hacking Team. It was the one that uh, spent the most money, even more than, in this chart you will see Mexico is way, way uh, the, big, the biggest client of Hacking Team, but also in the number of authorities. We found contracts with several local governors and authorities that don't have, that are not part of those groups that the Supreme Court said are the only ones that can do surveillance. And you can find several uh, police, even an oil company, but, but uh, uh, surveillance malware from this company, et cetera. In one case, for example, we were able to prove that the governor of one of the biggest states in Mexico, Jalisco, uh, where tequila come from, comes from, uh, but hacking team malware. And he said, and, and we proved that, he, I mean, basic, technically, the prosecutor of Jalisco can do surveillance, but the government of Jalisco can't do surveillance. And we proved that they, that who bought it was the government of Jalisco. They installed it even in a building that is part of the government of Jalisco, not the prosecutor. But when we discovered this, they told, they said first, no, it's not true. When we showed the contract, the signature of the, uh, of the official from the government, they said, okay, we bought it, but we bought it for the prosecutor and we gave it to them. And then we cross-referenced that information with the information that we got from the access to information requests. And we found that the federal prosecutor has only requested a court to do, to authorize surveillance three times. And that's according to the prosecutor, because according to courts, they have never come for authorization to surveil anyone. But let's take their word. They don't deserve it, but let's take their word. Three times in three years, you surveil a person. And we ha let's assume that those three times were with this malware. There's two scenarios. Either you spent millions of dollars in acquiring very highly sophisticated malware to use it on three people, or you're using it without a warrant and illegally. Both scenarios are horrible. Either you are incompetent and corrupt, or you are incompetent, corrupt, and a criminal. This, this showed us that there was this big market, there was this big uh, hunger in Mexico for acquiring these tools and for using it who, against who knows who. And then it came him. Him is Ahmed Mansour. He is actually right now a political prisoner in the United Arab Emirates. And he has been under surveillance by the United Arab Emirates government for uh, years. 
they have thrown everything at him. All the types of malware from different companies have been thrown at him. And he received a few messages. SMS messages that said he's a human rights activist, so they, it says, uh, here's evidence of, or it's like a news article, evidence of uh, torture to um, activists in the United Arab Emirates, and there's a link. He's savvy enough to know that this might be phishing attack, this might be uh, uh, an attempt to compromise his cell phone, so he contacts the Citizen Lab, which is a, a, a laboratory that's part of the University of Toronto that uh, does lots of security research, uh, and told them, hey, I received these messages. And Citizen Lab, what they did was uh, they put it on a phone that they could monitor, uh, and they clicked on it to see what happened. And two things happened. First, they discovered three exploits in the iPhone. If you have an iPhone in September or August, you received a, um, as a, an update on the, on the operating system that patch, patches those, uh, uh, those vulnerabilities that were found thanks to Ahmed Mansour and to Citizen Lab's work. And also, Citizen Lab was able to see what happened and what, what did the phone did and they, who did it connect with, and they were able to map the infrastructure of, of this company, Israeli company called NSO Group, uh, and they were able to also map all the domain names that were associated to those servers. So they got a list of, of uh, uh, over 200 domain names, uh, which Citizen Lab classified by country, basically by analyzing either whether those domain names um, are .mx or uh, they offer a service that is only sold in Mexico. Um, it's it pretty sometimes these domains trying to impersonate le legitimate businesses or, or newspapers or media organizations. So it was pretty easy to, to um, classify them that way. And, and they published this investigation that I urge you to, to visit. It's called The Million Dollar Dissident. Uh, they published this in August 2016. And they showed this chart, and I saw this chart and say, oh, Mexico is the biggest chunk of that pie chart. Uh, so that means most domains used by NSO as bait to, to infect phones with malware were associated to Mexico. That told me, well, there must be a lot of clients in Mexico, and there must be lots of victims. In that investigation, Citizen Lab was able to also identify a tweet from a journalist in Mexico that says, look at this. Uh, well, just a little bit of background. This journalist, uh, with other journalists, uncovered one of the biggest corruption scandals in Mexico. Uh, the president of the, of the country um, uh, received, and, and, and his wife uh, received a big house, very expensive house, almost for free, from a contractor that later got lots of contracts from the Mexican government. This became like known as the Casablanca scandal, the White House scandal, because the house he got was white. And this was one of the main journalists working on this story. And they have got, after they published this, they become enemies of the state. Basically, uh, uh, the main journalist that I will talk about a little bit later, Carmen Ariste, she lost, she was the biggest I and mean, the, the most listened uh, news radio show in the country. She lost that because of the pressure the government gave to the to the um, radio station, uh, and there were lots of threats, etc. And he interpreted these these messages, SMS messages he received, as a threat because they say the presidency will the, the, the SMS message he received says something like the presidency will sue for defam defamation to those that publish the Casablanca report, um, and he tweeted like. I'm receiving these messages, it's not funny. He, he thought they were threats, but they were actually attempts into infecting his phone with this malware sold by this NSO group, this malware called Pegasus. This, the, the, just uh, to, to explain a little bit more of the, of the messages, I will, you will see it in other examples later, but uh, it says uno tv, uno tv that's, um, uh, a, a media organization, uh, that's like a news portal, um, and they use a shortener, uh, but once you uh, analyze that link, it leads you to, uh, instead of unotv.com, uno which is the legitimate site, it takes you to, um, it leads to unotv.net, which is 
one of those domains that the NSO, uh, Citizen Lab was able to map as part of NSO infrastructure. So, but we still didn't know that. We just saw this in, in the report. We saw the pie chart. We saw that there was this suspicion that there was these journalists in Mexico that had been also targeted with this technology. And we started to try to find, oh, I got a little jumpy. Uh, we, tra we started to try to find uh, who, the amendment source in Mexico. Who, who are the targets in Mexico? Um, and we eventually found a bunch of them. Um, if you looked at the New York Times in February or June or four times that this year has been in the front page, um, in a collaboration, in an investigation that we have done, we, these cases, we, we ended up in the New York Times. Uh, they talk about how we have found uh, more than 20 uh, people that have been uh, targets of this uh, Pegasus malware. We call this investigation, uh, the Gobierno Espia investigation. Uh, it was a big scandal in Mexico, uh, particularly after uh, June 19, which we published, and New York Times published, and Citizen Lab published uh, uh, this investigation. Uh, uh, it became a big scandal uh, in Mexico because it basically revealed that all these people, all these people's eyes, um, uh, were surveilled. And I'm gonna speak to you about who are these people and, and what does it say about the situation in Mexico. For example, there is this case. Uh, it's, this, this is an organization, a human rights organization called Centro Pro. It's one of the biggest and most important organizations in Mexico. They've been representing families uh, for, of, of human rights abuses, the most high impact abuses, for example, uh, uh, killings by the army, or there was a very high profile case uh, that maybe some of you have heard about the disappearance of 43 students uh, in 2014. They represent the families of those students. It became a huge scandal, huge protest in the streets. Uh, it almost toppled the government. Uh, uh, and, uh, and they've been in a very contentious uh, position uh, because the government does, has been putting lots of obstacles for that investigation to happen, and they have been representing the families that want to know what happened with those with their kids, which are still disappeared. And three people inside that organization received this, uh, Pegasus infection attempts. For example, its director, Mario Patron, he received um, a message that says, the Mexican government fools uh, HIAI. HIAI is a group of international experts that was brought into the country to investigate uh, the, the disappearance of the 43 students. This group of independent experts was brought to the country because of the pressure that, that happened on the streets and the media and the scandal that was putting pressure on the government to accept this in, in independent investigation because people were rightfully suspicious that the official investigation was not going to lead anywhere. And here we see something that is very important, and we did this analysis with all the messages that, that we were able to document. He received this message. It's four days before the, this group of in the, in the independent experts published their final report. And the, it also received the message one, the same day that uh, a, a group of uh, uh, forensic analysts, uh, independent analysts were, because the official thesis or the official story by the government is that the four students were burned in a, in a, a dumpster. However, there's, there's uh, scientific evidence that show that this uh, uh, this cannot be true, that the, the fire that will have, the, the dimensions of the fire would have been, uh, would have le leave traces of it uh, and, and it was not possible to do it in the way in the way and the place where the government says it happened and when it, it says it happened. And this uh, forensic analysis showed this scientific evidence that, uh, there, that, that this was not true, that the story uh, that the government used to cover up what happened uh, was false. So th th it was a very highly like, uh, tense moment for the organization and, and, and a contentious uh, situation between this organization and the government. And that's exactly when he received these messages. And then, for example, there's this, uh, I already talked about them, Aristegui Noticias, which is a, an independent uh, news portal. Carmen Aristegui, she's one of the most important uh, journalists in Mexico. She was, uh, she, is, uh, she revealed many scandals, the Casablanca scandal. Um, she has received lots of pressure by many uh, government and even its own um, uh, broadcasting uh, uh, company, which she worked um, uh, for, for these investigations. 
And we have, we, we, we've been able to document uh, more than 50 messages received to her, uh, her son, who actually lives in the United States, who received messages, and other two journalists uh, of, of Aristegui Noticias. They also received these messages in, in, in moments in which they were revealing information, they were revealing stories that were particularly uncomfortable for the government. There's another case, Carlos Dorez de Mola, he's also a, a very famous uh, broadcaster. He's like, I don't know, like an Anderson Cooper of Mexico. He's a, a very famous uh, news anchor uh, from a very big broadcasting company that has actually been seen by Mexicans as very close to power. Uh, but still, he also received messages, and particularly he received, for example, this message impersonating the US Embassy saying, we, we detected a problem with your visa, please come to the embassy, see details and the link. And that link was a link to infect his phone uh, with Pegasus malware. He received six messages in, in a month in which he was covering this, a story of uh, a federal police killing uh, of, of civilians in one, in one small town in Mexico. Particularly when he was covering that story is when he received these messages and, and, and apparently the government was, um, and I will later explain why I think, it, why there's evidence it was the government, um, was trying to surveil him. There's, all these people have, and this is just three examples, but you can see in the report, if you read Spanish, more, more and more cases, and all, they all have one thing in common. They were working as journalists or human rights defenders in things that the government didn't want them to, do, to work on. They even targeted the GIEI, which I talk about. These experts that were invited into the country to investigate the, the disappearance of these 43 students were actually surveilled. In, and this is, this is the, the, I mean, the, the most outraging thing to me. There are 43 kids disappeared. And you pushed all this legislation and you bought all this equipment by using the argument that you need these tools to prosecute crime and to prevent these bad things to happen. And instead of using that surveillance to target, to find the students and to, and to find those responsible for his disappearance, they used it against their lawyers or their families. They used it against independent experts that were brought into the country to, to investigate the situation. And this is really, shows what the pro what's the problem and what the consequences of the surveillance. This was also in the New York Times. This was the third publication that we were able to get the New York Times to uh, cover in, the, in their front page. There was a fourth one uh, uh, re more recently. But in general, uh, again, it, this, this shows uh, we, we, now we are closer to not, not looking like a team full hat paranoid. We found them, we found the victims, we found the stories, we found the connection between them and the government. And we found more stuff. We found that the NSO group only sells to governments. We found that each target costs around $70,000 and the Mexican government spent at least $80 million in acquiring uh, targets because the way it works, um, you, you buy targets. You buy, okay, the, the ability to target 500 people, which was, was what the, Mexican, one Mexican authority purchased. And we also found that the Mexican government acquired and used Pegasus. We have contracts, we have uh, the, the, the bills uh, that were also leaked and published. So it's clear now, it's it, without a doubt, that the Mexican government has Pegasus, that its main opponents, journalists, human rights defenders, were targeted. And still the government is claiming like, oh, this is what we investigate, it's a coincidence or whatever. So um, the, the, the worst part right now is that the prime suspect of carrying out the surveillance, the authority that purchased this Pegasus malware is the same authority that is in charge of the investigation of the spying. So we presented a lawsuit and the, against I mean, against PGR, which is the, the, like the Department of Justice of Mexico, or the prosecutor, the federal prosecutor, attorney general, uh, which is the prime suspect of being behind the surveillance because it's the only one that has accepted and documented that has acquired this, this malware. So we don't look as simple 
uh, uh, paranoids, TIFO had paranoids anymore. I think in this was a big scandal. It, it was weeks and weeks in the news. Uh, um, it even forced the president to make a statement. And he did as usual, horrible statement. We published on Monday, 19, June 19, and on Thursday, he went on TV and said, I'm instructing the prosecutor to investigate those that have revealed the story because they are lies. Then he backtracked because actually there's no, there's no law that can be used against those that have been publishing this information, but still, the damage was done. It was, there was outrage as well, and at least in the, in the media and, and the public, I think the journal public is established that the Mexican government is spying on journalists and human rights offenders. But that's not satisfying to me because those responsible are still free, they're not in jail, and this is probably still going on in Mexico. So there's still a lot of work to do. We are doing a lot of stuff to trying to uh, get justice in this case. Not only because, uh, as I mentioned, because of the spine in itself, but because of what it represents. And, and, and because instead of uh, using these tools to prosecute the corruption that this government has been found to be doing, the human rights abuses that this government has been assisting or covering up, it's being used against those that have exposed or have demanded justice for in Mexico. And I think that's something that is not acceptable uh, something that uh, if, if, if we leave it as just an anecdote, will repeat itself and probably will be more and more difficult to detect and to resist. But we're still, we're still fighting and probably, uh, we hope this story continues and continues with people uh, responsible for this um, uh, being accountable, held accountable. And I think there's, a, just to finish, uh, and maybe open up for questions if you have them, um, there's a lot that, many, that a lot of people can do to help. Uh, first, by knowing about these cases, by letting others know about these cases. And for example, as a company, being very aware about this uh, type of governments that have these intentions and have these resources and they will use them and they will actually use them against your customers. Uh, they're using it again, as against Android users and they're trying to find holes in your, in your um, uh, equipment to uh, try to surveil on human rights defenders, on journalists. So I think it's, it's important for Googlers to, to, to know about these type of cases, to try to understand uh, what people on the ground that use your services are fighting against and, and what you can do to help. And I think there's, there's a lot of things and there's a lot of, uh, of things that Google has done. Actually, I mean, this is maybe a little bit inappropriate to say, but it's true uh, in, in a way. Like, um, for example, Google has done a lot of things in encryption, and it's great. It's great that there's uh, encrypted uh, uh, from point to point, but uh, just, and this is of, of the no criticism of Google, it's, it's important to don't think that that saves people like these journalists and human rights defenders from being surveilled. Because actually what has led is for governments to buy malware to try to go, go around the encryption. And well, then if I cannot get, I cannot do man in the middle attacks because I will only get encrypted data, I will hack your phone and get it before you encrypt it. Uh, so uh, it's important to always think about the next step and, and how you can continuously improve the security of your products and your services. Because the other side, it's always also looking in ways to go around the things that you, that you uh, uh, create and you, and you uh, come up with to try to protect your users uh, more. So I encourage you to keep thinking of this, to, to uh, be in contact with us, to also know what, what the needs are in the ground, et cetera. And, and I thank you for, for, for your time and for your interest in, in, this, in this story. And well, let's, let's keep uh, fighting. <laughs> thank you. I don't know if someone has any questions. Uh, thanks for the, the talk. Um, you talked about how uh, you know, the, you know, the government is targeting specific people uh, and um, they're going after people who they have essentially grudges against. Um, is there, uh, what sort of efforts are there or, or should there be to sort of uh, educate those people and, and figure out you know, whether or not 
people are, are targets of surveillance. I mean, I know Google does some sort of stuff, but it's, it's difficult if you're using outdated phone or, or okay. whatever. Uh, is that something that, that you work on, or are there more sort of opportunities there? Well, definitely, there's people working on that, and there's opportunity there, both. And I think one of the main positive things about unco uncovering this is that most, ma many people have become aware of these threats. Uh, because, for example, the first publication we did was in February. And after we published that, uh, one case, many more said, hey, I saw that story, and I think I have the same messages. So the awareness also protects, because People now are more wary about receiving SMS messages with links. And, I mean, uh, I would say that most human rights defenders or journalists, and at least if you read and you were, you notice this these cases, you are way more wary. But this, there's still a lot of need. There's there's also a lot of organizations that were not taking security serious, and after this case, they say, okay, now we we have to devote resources and time and effort into building. Um, protocols and systems that, that uh, allow us to be more secure in our work. Uh, so definitely, and I think um, and there's room for, for doing stuff and, and for helping guys um, uh, develop those, those strategies to try to protect themselves. And I think uh, uh, whatever you, you guys can do to approach them, because there's so many uh, uh, in risk, um, it, it's, it's, it's a great way to, to also help. Um, what do you think the government stands to, or what does the government think it stands to gain from spying on these journalists? Be, is it more than just trying to stop these stories from publishing? Do you think that they have malicious motivations to, to kind of ruin their lives beyond that? Is there any evidence? Well, there's, there's a bunch of consequences that come from spying, and they go in there's different levels, and we have seen them all. We have seen, in some cases, just gathering information for later use, uh, intimidation, uh, or other more nefarious uh, situations. There's been actual cases of intimidation, of leaking that information into the, into the press and, and, and create reputational damage to yourself or your organization. But you have to understand that in Mexico, the line between government and organized crime is in many times non-existent. So, Surveillance has a potential uh, use or a potential to contribute to even harm and death to these people. I mean, it, there's, Mexico is one of the uh, most dangerous countries for journalists. Uh, I think uh, outside of Syria is the country where most journalists have, have died in the last years. Uh, the, just this year, there's been 11 journalists killed in Mexico. Uh, so uh, there's many ways in which surveillance can, can be used against these people, either uh, just knowing their strategies and trying to anticipate them. For example, you're a, you're a human rights organization, and I know what you're going to say in a meeting or in a lawsuit, and then I can try to, I mean, that intelligence helps me uh, uh, counter your strategy, but it can also be used to affect your reputation. We have, I've seen many sick stuff, uh, like trying to even like um, uh, like create just personal problems with your wife, or uh, there's some messages that says, oh, "Look, uh, look this video of of your husband uh, having sex with another person," and stuff like that. So there's also a, an intention on creating this turmoil in your life, so it uh, it, it it just it's an obstacle for you to conduct your work. So it's a whole range from just knowing and to reputation to even harm or, or even getting killed. Uh, and, and, and who knows what else they, they might be using it for. Do you know if your organization was ever targeted by the Mexican government? And what about your own security? They always ask this. Uh, um, I can't answer that question. OK. But uh, um, of course, it's a it's a consideration. Uh, you, if you work, uh, basically, if you do anything that the government doesn't like in Mexico, you are targeted. You need to think about these things, and we think about these things as well. Um, uh, our threat model definitely increased after <laughs> after these publications. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, this question, uh, another question, different person. What 
your investigation and research has uncovered is alarming. Thanks for sharing in this forum. Generally speaking, what is your advice or recommendation for people who may be targeted of surveillance? First, don't click the link. That's the first thing. Uh, don't click any link that you know. If, you, if someone sends you something and you're not sure, ask that person, hey, did you send me the link? Uh, that's the first thing. Uh, uh, and the second is to contact us or other organizations that are on the ground or outside of Mexico that are doing work trying to uh, detect this uh, because it, it helps. For example, the sec I mean, Amit Mansour, who is actually in jail, and I think everyone should try to do something to get him out of jail, for example, he did a great service to millions of users of iPhone. Because thanks to his savviness and with the, the collaboration he did with Citizen Lab, uh, uh, three security holes in the iPhone were patched thanks to him, to him detecting them. So I think um, more collaboration. I think this also investigation is also an example of the collaboration that needs to happen between different organizations to tackle this, this, this problem uh, because it affects uh, many people. And, and we have different knowledge. I have the relationships because building this trust and relationships with the victims is something that takes time, effort, et cetera. And, and we've been lucky enough and, and, and to be able to build these relationships and be able to get these messages. But we, stand, we, we collaborated with Citizen Lab to try to uh, 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 analyze them and have all the technical evidence uh, uh, on, on the cases. And, and I think definitely, for example, in the case of Citizen Lab, they have collaborated with companies even to also give them uh, in a responsible disclosure procedure information about these holes so they can patch them, et cetera. And I think, for example, this is something that, that I know Google has been working on. There's been also publications on how they are trying to detect uh, uh, um, attacks from malware uh, developed by NSO Group. Um, uh, and, and I think this is something that is very important. The collaboration between, uh, between institutions, civil society, uh, acad academy, corporations, to try to detect and protect um, uh, users of technology. Thank you, Luis Fernando, for oh, joining us you. today. And thank you, everyone. Thank you.